Welcome to this Radio Design 101 episode on radio frequency mixers. This is part two. Our goal today, as it has been throughout this series, is to understand the hardware design of radio. To do that, we will have to cover a little bit of mathematics, but we'll try to keep that brief so that we can get right into mixer circuit designs. And then at the end, we'll illustrate how something like an FM broadcast band receiver actually works by down converting a spectrum, selecting the channel you want, and then in the next episode we'll talk about demodulation. Now before we jump into today's material, here is a quick review of what we covered in part one of this episode. The mixer, shown here, takes two signals, uh, one at one frequency and one at another, in this case, the RF was at 90 megahertz and the local oscillator was at 70. And its job is to create new signals at different frequencies, which in this case is 20 megahertz. That's the primary down converted output that would then be filtered in the radio and amplified further before demodulation. Mixers can also, as we illustrated in part one, create what's called an up converted product at 160 megahertz in this example. In the lower right, you can see the spectrum that we created using the instrumentation over here on the left, together with this hardware mixer design in the middle. The spectrum actually contains several output frequencies. One is the down converted one at 20 megahertz. One is the up converted one at 160 megahertz. But we also got some LO feed through that was at 70 megahertz. And the RF signal that was at 90 came through as well. Today, we'll talk about the origin of some of these other frequencies that come out. But first, the math. I'll try to keep this part brief, and I know that mathematics is not everybody's first language. But it is a language, and it is important to understand a little bit of this as we go forward. On the right, we have a mixer, and it takes two inputs, and both of these are time varying, hence the T in the parentheses and it creates one output, which is also time varying. And you can see that in the plot down in the bottom right hand corner. In this case, we've created a 100 megahertz sine wave through the formula in the upper left. And we did that by using Excel with two columns. One are time values in the left hand column. The other are voltage values that are generated from this equation. The parameters of the sine wave, of course, involve the frequency, its phase, and its amplitude. So here's what happens in an ideal mixer. The output is just the product of the LO and the RF incoming signals. If we plug in formulas for those signals in terms of cosines, then we get the second expression here. And finally, if we use the trig identities we learned in high school, we were able to take the second line and turn it into the third line in this formula. And we'll parse this result in a few seconds and see what it's trying to tell us. But before we do that, let's come at it a simpler way. Remember that the output of the mixer is the input waveform times the LO waveform. That's also shown here in the bottom left of this slide. Using Excel, we just generated two sine waves, one at 90 megahertz and one at 70 megahertz, and then pointwise multiplied them at every time step. So 0 times 0 at t equals 0 equals 0. All right, that was easy. But if you take all of these other time steps, you multiply the RF voltage here times the LO voltage here, you get out the second dot down here at the bottom. And likewise for the third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and so forth. As you do this over all the time points, you get this bottom waveform. This is the output of the mixer. And obviously looking at it, we can see a lower frequency component. That's the 20 megahertz that we expect. And we can see a higher frequency component that's even higher than either of the two that went in. And that one is at 160 megahertz. And we can also see those outputs in the spectrum analyzer plot here in the lower right. There's the 20 megahertz down converted product and there's the 160 megahertz up converted product. And that, in a nutshell, is what this final formula is telling us. But it does tell us more, and that's why we do the mathematics. The IF time domain waveform, VIF of T, 
is equal to two terms here. And those correspond to the 20 megahertz down converted product and the 160 megahertz up converted product in this example. We can see that clearly in the formula from the difference of the two frequencies and the sum of the two frequencies. But if we try to parse this mathematical expression a little bit more, we can understand more of what the mixer does. Not only does it translate the RF frequency down to a lower IF frequency, but the output retains the modulation of any signal that we're trying to process. For example, there could be amplitude modulation where the magnitude of the RF signal is varying with time. And if you look at this expression, you can see that, that in the case of the down-converted sinusoid, it also has that RF magnitude associated with it. So if this number gets bigger, then the output gets bigger. Likewise, the phase, if there's phase modulation, that will get translated down to the down-converted product output at IF. And of course, if the RF frequency is varying, then this difference will vary, and we will see that at the output as we did in part one of this episode. Now that's ideally what's going to happen, but if you look at the spectrum, it doesn't correspond exactly to the math or the waveforms that we generated. Yes, we have the 20 megahertz and the 160, but we also have all of this other stuff. So let's talk about where that comes from. Here's the answer to that question. Real mixers multiply by square waves at the LO frequency, not sine waves. And we'll see that in just a second when we talk about mixer circuit designs. But first, let's see the ramifications of this. What happens differently when the LO is a square wave or, in general, a pulse train like this? Well, obviously, the IF output waveform is going to be different. But more importantly, the spectrum is going to be radically different, as shown on the right-hand side. To understand this spectrum and where all the different frequencies come from, we have to understand that a square wave, or a pulse train in general, contains several frequencies that are harmonically related to the fundamental frequency, which in this case is 70 megahertz. There may be some DC offset. So in this example, it looks like it's kind of moved up a little bit, not centered at zero. But in addition to that, there are harmonics of 70 megahertz. So there's 140 megahertz, 2 times 70, and 210, it's 3 times 70, and so forth. What that does to the IF output waveform down here to the, at the bottom is quite a mess. But in the spectrum domain, or the frequency domain, we can actually understand where all these things are coming from. So this is a 0 to 350 megahertz sweep on the tiny spectrum analyzer. So this is 20 megahertz, because it's about two-fifths of the way over to the first vertical line. And look, here's 70 megahertz. So that's some of the LO feed-through that we saw previously. And here's the 90 megahertz RF feed-through. But what's going on with this 120? Where'd that come from? Uh, the 140, okay, that's two times the 70, so that looks like the harmonic of the LO coming through. The 160, what's that? Well, that's the upconverted product that we expect. The 210 is three times the LO, but then there's some others as well. So there's quite a lot of signals that come out of a practical switching mixer as opposed to the idealized linear mixer. And classically, those frequencies that come out are given by this formula in the bottom right. But let's move on to the good stuff. Let's move on to circuit design. To make a mixer, all you need is a single diode. But it has to be a particular type. It has to be a Schottky diode, which turns on and off very quickly. Alternatively, you can make mixers out of single transistors or vacuum tubes. In the diode mixer, it works like this. You have to have a sufficiently large local oscillator signal. So let's say this is like one volt peak in amplitude, unloaded. And let's say this is a 50 ohm resistance and a 50 ohm load over at the IF. Let's ignore the RF for a moment. When the local oscillator waveform is high, or more particularly when it's high enough to turn on the Schottky diode, which requires a few hundred millivolts of amplitude, 
you will get current flowing through the diode to the load. And also this Schottky diode will have what's called a low dynamic resistance. Now coming back to the RF, if there's an RF signal fed into here, then during that time there's a low resistance here and the RF signal can get through to the output. Then when the LO signal goes low and becomes negative, the diode is reversed biased and it shuts off and little or no RF signal gets through to the IF. And that behavior is captured in this diagram at the top. The LO turns a switch on and off. And when the switch is closed, the RF gets through and when it's open, obviously it doesn't. So effectively the IF becomes the RF waveform multiplied by either zero or one. One when the diode is on and zero when it's off. And so you're basically multiplying by a DC offset square wave. And you can get this kind of behavior that we just talked about. A single transistor or tube mixer can work very similarly. Shown in the bottom right here is a transistor. The bias details are not shown. So I need to tell you that this transistor is initially turned on a little bit with some bias resistors here in the power supply. But when the LO then goes positive, the transistor turns on more and you get a nice amplifier for any RF coming in. But when the LO goes negative, it will actually shut this transistor off and therefore it is not amplifying. So the difference between this and the diode mixer is number one, the transistor may not be as fast as a diode, so you don't always see this happen. But also, instead of multiplying by one, you're multiplying by the gain of this transistor circuit when it's on. So here's an example of a circuit like that that's from a vintage FM broadcast band receiver. The signal from the antenna comes in through this RF transformer over here and gets amplified by an LNA created by a JFET. And we've covered all of this material in previous episodes of this series. Likewise, we've covered local oscillators. There's one down here at the bottom. This is a common collector, Culpitz oscillator, and we're taking the output from the base. The mixer is shown here. The LO comes in through capacitor C8, and the RF comes in through capacitor C5. And these two capacitors create voltage dividers. They also pass those signals on into the biased transistor. And this transistor performs the mixing operation that we just talked about. The output at the IF goes through this IF transformer, or IFT, and onto some IF bandpass filtering. Now the nice thing about transistor mixers, aside from the fact that they provide some conversion gain, is what it's called, is that they don't need a very large local oscillator drive signal. Unlike the diode, which might require uh, 500 millivolts or a volt of amplitude, this guy only needs about 100 millivolts peak. And that's why C8, this capacitor, is only 0.47 picofarads. There's a couple of volts signal in the Culpitz oscillator signal here at the base, and we don't need all of that to turn this on. So we have a small capacitance here, which creates a fairly large reactance, and that's good because we don't get a lot of loading from the local oscillator connection. So there are a lot of details and subtleties in these designs, and we're not going to cover that level of detail today. However, I did put some equations up here on the right-hand side that you can pause this video and work through these and think about them relative to the other episodes in this series. I will comment that these equations give the current at the output, the collector current in this transistor, as opposed to the final voltage output. So if we take the last expression, we would need to multiply by whatever resistance is seen looking into this IF transformer from the collector. And then that would square with the idea that the gain of this transistor is GM times R, that resistance looking into this IF transformer at the center frequency. So R is missing in the second term of this expression simply because this is the collector current, not the final output voltage. This term K2 
is simply the voltage division ratio of the RF as it goes through this capacitor and is slightly loaded by C8. It's essentially one in this design, so you can ignore K2. Note also there is a fairly large LO output from this thing, as you can see in the first term. And that's one downside to using a simple single transistor mixer like this. Modern products benefit from more sophisticated designs that are enabled by the fact that transistors are dirt cheap these days because you can get thousands or millions of them in a single integrated circuit. And those modern products typically use what are called Gilbert cell mixers. And we're going to take a look at those in a minute. Before we look at Gilbert cell mixers, however, let's take a little step back in time and look at this ham radio transceiver. This is a transmit mixer that up converts from, I think it's like 5 megahertz, I'm not sure, uh, to the final output frequency, which can be in any of the ham radio HF bands. The signal that comes from the modulator comes in here through C402 to the grid of the vacuum tube. The local oscillator signal comes in on the cathode. So the signal that controls the plate current is the voltage difference between those two. The modulated signal we're trying to upconvert and the local oscillator we're using to do that upconversion with. Just like in the case of the BJT, the local oscillator signal that comes in on the cathode here is turning this tube on and off so that the amplification is turned on and off as well. And that's done at the rate of the LO signal, so you're multiplying by a square wave. The only difference is that the LO signal here is fed in on the cathode, so this tube goes into an off state only when the LO is positive. When it's negative, the tube is on, so that's a little bit reversed. The other difference is that the LO drive level for tubes is going to have to be a volt or two, unlike a 100 millivolts for the BJT mixer. Lastly, before we go on to the modern Gilbert cell design, here's an example of a modern diode mixer. A diode mixer is used inside this low-cost Doppler radar. You might use one of these for checking the speed of a baseball or a tennis ball or something like that. This is from a site called allaboutcircuits.com, and they have something called Teardown Tuesdays, uh, where they took apart the radar gun. And I pulled the data sheet from the MACOM device that they talk about that's used inside here, and I put the product specs over here on the lower left. Notice there's a Schottky diode in there. That's what's at play in this mixer. And it works essentially like what we talked about here. Now, most modern high-performance mixer designs use what are called balanced architectures. And the end result is that the IF is the RF multiplied by a square wave, which is completely bipolar. So it goes from negative some gain to positive some gain. That limits the amount of RF that's fed through to the IF output. They also use circuit designs that try to minimize the amount of LO that gets to the IF output. And there are two of these balanced architectures that we're going to talk about. One is a diode ring mixer, and the other is the so-called Gilbert cell design. This is what we're trying to do. We take the RF signal and we feed it through a differential amplifier, single-ended input but differential output. And then we have some transistors that perform a switching operation. And they're configured as a double-pole, double-throw switch, as we'll see, which is controlled by local oscillator signal. So for the positive half cycle of the LO, the switch is, for example, as shown. And the output is just whatever the output of the amplifier is. But when the LO goes negative, the switch moves to the other position, both switches, and the output is the inverse of that. So that means that the IF output is the RF times negative AV instead of positive AV. And here's how a circuit like this might be built in practice. These lower two transistors form a differential amplifier, and the RF input comes over here on the bottom left. The upper four transistors steer the collector currents from those two sides of the differential amplifier to these two resistors. But in one state of the LO, the left-hand 
differential amplifier transistor is steered to this resistor, but in the other one it's steered to the right-hand resistor. And that performs the switching operation that we see up here. The diode ring mixer operates somewhat similarly, except it uses diodes for switching. Here the LO is coming in on the left and the RF is coming in on the right. On the positive half cycle of the LO input on the left, 2A is positive and 3B is negative and the two right hand diodes are turned on. On the negative half cycle of the LO input, the other diodes are turned on and the two right hand ones are turned off. So let's consider that state for a second. That means that these diodes on the right are off, so we can ignore the upper part of this transformer that's bringing in the RF and concentrate only on the lower part. The top half of that transformer, uh, specifically node 3A, is connected to the IF output. 3B is connected to these diodes, which are on, so remember they have low resistance now, and that effectively connects them to this ground. So that means that the RF signal from 1A to 1B, which is reflected over to 3A to 3B, shows up directly at the IF output. Conversely, when the right-hand diodes are on and the left-hand diodes are off, there's an inversion that takes place due to the way the transformer is hooked up. So the diode ring mixer is performing this operation with these switches, but the difference is there's no gain. There's actually loss through the diode ring mixer. So AV here would be a number like one half. And here are a couple of diode ring mixers that you can actually buy. Uh, these are from a company called Mini Circuits. For this surface mount one, an ADE-1+, the uh, transformers and the diodes are in this little package that you can then just solder on your circuit board. The specs are down here at the bottom, and notice it says conversion loss. Uh, conversion loss is about 5 dB typically, and they also have frequency ranges and other information for you. Because these are diode mixers, the LO drive level tends to be fairly high. It's like plus 4 to plus 10 dBm for one of these. If you don't want to build your own board and you just want to wire some stuff up with some coaxes, they have packaged ones as well. And what's inside these boxes are really just some of these on a little circuit board typically, I think. Uh, but this one has BNC connectors. It makes it more convenient to use. They have dozens and dozens of these, so you might want to go to their site and just kind of explore. They also make amplifiers and lots of other things. Now, in our university radio design class, we've sometimes actually built our own mixers for FM broadcast band receivers. You can do that with some of these ferrite cores and trifler windings is what you call this. We've also used some mini circuits or other mixers um, in other projects. But a lot of times we use Gilbert cell mixers. So let's take a look at that next. This is our go-to part. It comes by various names, uh, NE602 or SA602, depending on the manufacturer. But they're all Gilbert cell IC mixers. The datasheet information that I'm showing here is from a Philips Semiconductors datasheet. And the part that we used in part one of this episode was made by Signetics, and you can see a picture of it here. This is a dual inline package one. It's very nice for doing the prototyping boards because it's not too small. But you can get these in surface mount packages as well. And I think NXP is one of the current manufacturers of this. At the top level, the datasheet gives you this information. It's an 8-pin device. Pins 1 and 2 go to the RF amplifier. Pin 3 is a ground. Pins 4 and 5 are the IF output. And 6 and 7 is where the LO goes in. But it says oscillator because you can also use this to form a common collector Culpitz oscillator of your own if you don't already have one. And then finally, uh, VCC comes in on pin 8. Performance-wise, uh, go to the datasheet to get more information. But here are some example parameters. The input frequency can go up to 500 megahertz, and the local oscillator can run up to 200 megahertz. So it's good for VHF work. Conversion gain. They quote it as 17 dB, but it depends on how well you do your matching at the input and the output of this device. 
The RF input impedance is 1.5k ohms, but it's shunted with about 3 picofarads. So you have to take account for that when you're doing your matching. And the output impedance at IF is 1.5k, but as you'll see, it could be 3k if you're doing differential. So let's take a look at the next part. So elsewhere in the data sheet, we can find more information, of course. This is the internal circuits of the device. When we use this in the course, we've previously built a VCO for the receiver, so we just feed the LO in on pin 6 and leave pin 7 open. So it just goes in through a buffer, and then that goes to these upper four transistors. Remember, those are the switches. The lower two transistors are the RF amplifier. And the collector of that RF amplifier either connects up to this resistor, 1.5K to VCC, or if the right-hand transistor is on, then it connects up to this resistor, 1.5K. And that's how the commutation of the output is done to get the plus and minus gain values. The IF outputs are on pin 4 and 5, differential output. And notice that there is an error in this data sheet. Uh, there should not be a dot here. So the IF output impedance from each of these pins is 1.5K to AC ground when this is bypassed up here at VCC. So the total differential output impedance is 3K, and that's important to keep in mind when you're doing your matching. And in the data sheet, they give you some information on how you might configure matching networks. And we'll take a look at the output here first. That's over on the right-hand side. They have several different examples shown. The first one here is for a monolithic ceramic or monolithic crystal filter. They're assuming that this has got a 1.5K ohm optimal impedance value, but ours have 300 ohms, as we're going to see in a couple slides forward. So you need a matching network if you're going to do it this way. And if there's 300 ohm looking out here, and this is 1.5K, then we need to match down from 1.5K to 300. I would recommend using a capacitor to ground here and then a series inductor forming an L network for that. Creates a nice low pass matching network, which is good for getting rid of the higher frequency mixer products. At the top right is another example, and the matching network there is a little bit different. Notice there's an inductor to ground here and then a series capacitor. They need that for a DC block because whenever you're using an IC, there are internal DC bias voltages that if you mess them up by shorting it to ground with an inductor or something, then the chip's not going to work. So here there's a DC blocking cap, which is probably also part of the match. Down at the lower left, they have an IF transformer. I don't understand this connector up here at the top. I think this is probably just a capacitor to ground is probably what should be there. And then over on the right-hand side is another IF transformer configuration where, as I said, there's probably 3K ohm impedance between these two pins. You can see that in the schematic diagram, so take that into account if you decide to use this kind of a match. Now, moving back to the input, remember the input impedance is 1.5K to ground in parallel with 3 picofarads. And there are various suggested matching networks that you could use. The one on the right is the one that I used in episode one. In fact, I didn't even match. I just went directly from the RF into pin one. So I was driving from a 50 ohm source into a 1.5K ohm input impedance and AC grounding pin two. Now, that's not a problem, except that I have lower gain than if I had done impedance matching. Now, most people today don't like using transformers. They're kind of bulky and expensive and somewhat of a pain. So I'd suggest maybe matching something like this on the left. So the capacitor from C2 to ground is just an AC bypass, so that's a large value, say a nanofarad or 10 nanofarads. And then these two and the inductor form the match and it's essentially a tapped capacitor matching network similar to what we've covered in previous episodes of this series. And if you want to see what we did in episode one, then go there and uh, there's a schematic of this circuit board that we built. Now, even though this is an older design, this thing's been around for a couple of decades, I think, um, it's still used in modern products. And one of those is the Nano VNA except it's a slightly different part number. 
Uh, there it's an SA612, but for the life of me, I don't know the difference between the 602 and the 612. The schematics are essentially identical. So if you want to kind of explore this, um, I'm going to, for time reasons, not go over this slide. But again, pause the video and take a look. This is the internals of the Nano VNA using three copies of these SA612, in this case, mixers. They're the smaller surface mount variety. So let's wrap this video up by coming back to the FM broadcast band receiver project that we do in our course. This is the block diagram that we've talked about in previous videos. The antenna comes in to a pre-select filter and a low noise amp and an image filter. And then we go on to our mixer, which is fed, of course, by an LO, which could be a voltage controlled oscillator, or it could be even be frequency synthesized. Ultimately, then, the output of the mixer is going to be at 10.7 megahertz, and we'll go through an IF filter to select the channel we want. And that'll be based on the frequency that we tune the LO to. And that signal at 10.7 megahertz now goes to an amplifier, and then it'll get demodulated. We're going to cover this in the next video. But before we do that, let's use the mixer that we've just talked about to down-convert the FM broadcast band to a much lower frequency. Now it's going to be done right before this filter. I don't have results with the filter in there. That's part of what the class can do later, but we'll look at filters as well. And here's that result. What we've got is the low noise amp that we designed in earlier episodes, talked about that, connected to an antenna. It's just a wire here of reasonable length for the FM broadcast band. And then that goes to the mixer and the output of the mixer goes to the tiny SA spectrum analyzer. And you can see a blow up of what's on the screen at this instant uh, in this diagram right here in the upper left of the three spectrums. This spectrum plot is from 0 to 350 megahertz. And what was coming into the RF is shown in the upper right. This is the FM broadcast band, again, on the spectrum analyzer going from 0 to 350 megahertz. So we're about 98 megahertz with a 20 megahertz wide bandwidth of signals. And there are a lot of stations in that set. The strongest one is at 96.3 megahertz. Now the LO is coming from this analog signal generator, so I can just tune it with a knob. It's currently set to about 85 megahertz. And I, you can see that here in this plot, there's a marker, marker number one, and it reads out as 84.775 megahertz, but that's essentially 85 megahertz. So we're taking 96 megahertz and 85 megahertz and mixing them, and what we get is that 96 megahertz will be converted down to 11 megahertz. And that's shown in the bottom plot. Notice, however, that not only is that signal converted down, but all of the other channels are as well. So these are all the, the FM broadcast stations in my area. This plot comes from the left-hand side of the output above. So this is the down-converted FM broadcast band. And all we need to do at this point is feed this through a 10.7 megahertz filter to pass the signal we want, maybe it's this big one, and reject all of these others. Or we could retune the LO so that we center any of these signals at 10.7 megahertz and even reject the strong one, if our filter's good enough. The filters that we typically use are these three leaded ceramic filters at 10.7 megahertz with a bandwidth of about 200 kilohertz. This is from the Nano VNA um, circuit board. This is on the Nano VNA board that you can buy to look at different kinds of components with your instrument. And you can see the response down here at the bottom. Now, if you look carefully, you'll note that there's about 22 dB of loss here. That's because they don't have any matching on this thing. As far as I can tell, what they actually have is a 50 ohm resistor to ground uh, coming off of this connector and then a 270 ohm resistor feeding into this filter. So the filter sees about 300 ohms as it wants to. And on the other side, I think they just have a, like a 270 ohm series resistor. And the reason I'm saying these things is because if I look at the S11, 
on one side I get very close to 50 ohms and on the other side I get something closer to 300 ohms over here 297. In any case there's no matching and so the insertion loss shown on the nano VNA here is wildly inferior to what you could actually get with the filter itself. Now these things also come in surface mount form and here's a data sheet from Murata. The insertion losses tend to be around 4 dB or so and the input output impedance is specified. It's 330 ohms. They're fairly resilient. You can use them from maybe 250 ohms up to 400 without massive changes in the response but you don't want to put 50 ohms on them. In the class we've actually measured these with some 4 to 1 impedance matching transformers so that we get closer to the ideal response. Very nice flat pass band, a little bit of drop off here for the order of the filter makes sense. The out of band rejection is 10, 20, 30, 40, about 50 dB. But typically people will use two of these in series. So you can get about 100 dB of alternate channel rejection if you put those two filters in a row right here before you go on to what is going to be our next project. Project 4 in the course is the IF subsystem and audio amplifier. And we're going to target that for the next episode. So that's it for this one. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, there were a lot of things I wanted to go into more detail on, but these things get pretty long. So I decided to just leave it at this. If you have any questions, please feel free to leave them in the comments below. And as always, thank you for watching.